Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Real. I am one of the PhD students in the um, PhD program here in the iSchool at the University of Maryland. I am also one of the coordinators for this event today. Um, since the University of Maryland has the extreme privilege of being in very close proximity to many of our nation's greatest cultural heritage institutions, including the Library of Congress, National Archives, Smithsonian Institution, and I could go on for probably about 20 minutes, which would say a lot. Uh, we wanted to be sure to include some of that institutional knowledge in our program today. So as for this panel, we are looking at how diversity is being addressed within our local major cultural heritage institutions, focusing on the Smithsonian. So we are going to have two speakers, um, Beth Zivarth, who is um, the director of the Smithsonian Institution Accessibility Program, and Michael Pond, who is media archivist and interim head archivist for the Smithsonian Institution National Museum of the American Indian Archives. I will introduce um, Michael when he's up to speak after Beth, but to introduce Beth um, very, briefly, ah, very briefly, Beth Zivarth has a personal interest and professional responsibility in advocacy for people with disabilities. She currently serves as the director of the Smithsonian's Accessibility Program. In her position, Ms. Zebarth develops and implements accessibility policy and guidelines for the institution's 19 museums, the National Zoo, nine research centers, ensuring that the Smithsonian's 30 million annual visitors experience a welcoming environment that accommodates individuals of all ages and abilities. Ms. Zebarth develops partnerships between the Smithsonian and disability educational and cultural organizations, including the University of Maryland iSchool, which um, was part of the museum's Morning at the Museum program, in order to increase the institution's audience of people with disabilities. She provides technical assistance to Smithsonian units on faculty or facility, exhibition and program accessibility issues, and coordinates with Smithsonian administration to resolve formal and informal accessibility complaints. Ms. Zebarth has been a Smithsonian staff member for over 20 years. So please welcome Beth Zebarth. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm lucky that I'm here today to talk about something I love to do, which is um, working with the museums to provide accessibility to people with disabilities. Officers who are at the door 
to um, maintenance people within the building to make sure that they can maintain the accessibility to docents and the people working in the shops or in the cafeteria. And collaborations. So my office works with a variety of organizations. Kennedy Center, we do a lot of um, programs or um, projects together. And National Park Service, a variety of different organizations. That way we can really um, benefit each other by collaborating on something that we can um, further accessibility in cultural arts. Effective communication. Um, in the law, when we're talking about programs, um, they talk about effective communication. And effective communication is spelled out for how you do this in, um, in museums. So we've looked at um, the intent of the law and come up with strategies for providing effective communication. So this could be um, for exhibitions or for public programs. And what you want to do is really concentrate on providing meaningful experiences for people with disabilities. Um, <coughs> you want to use multimodal and multi-sensory approaches. So I'll give you some examples in the photographs in a minute. You want to build accessibility into exhibitions, but you also want to have access services that you can add through docents or through staff. So um, I'll just give you some examples of <coughs> photos. These are two um, photos. One photo is of the um, really culture exhibition of a few years ago. And you can see the beaded gown um, behind me here. And then next to it is a label with a shelf. And on the shelf is a tactile element. And we asked the artists who participated in this particular show to work with us by providing tactile elements that would be uh, similar to their artwork. And so this was a beaded piece, just like the beaded dress, and provided um, information for people who are blind or have low vision, and anybody who learns better through tactile um, examination. The picture on the other side is of a woman using Talk, this is hard to say. Talking tactile tablet. Go try to say that three times in a row. Um, and the talking tactile tablet, or TTT, was um, a piece that we used, an assistive technology piece that we used in the um, whatever happened to polio exhibition a number of years ago. And the purpose of this was to um, use a raised line graphic that had audio embedded in it. So if you ran your finger over the raised line graphic, and you would get um, audio as you press on it parts of the graphic. And that provided information for people who are blind and have more vision. And to make it more universally designed, we added a monitor so that people who couldn't hear the sound could get the text equivalent. Um, and we found that we were using this for explaining the, um, the polio life cycle. And we had four other elements in the exhibition that talked about the polio life cycle. This was the one that everybody felt like they really understood what was going on. They had the tactile element, they had graphics, they had labels, but this put everything together. People really did understand what we were trying to explain with the polio life cycle. <coughs> Two other um, examples of accessibility within museums. So on the top we have a young man who is giving a tour in sign language. And what we do for this particular program is called Art Signs. It's at American Art. Um, they've trained a number of uh, volunteers to provide um, sign language explanations of particular works of art. And then we hire an interpreter who voices for the, the person who's using sign language so that it can be more universally designed. And um, it's very, the people who work on this and the people who go on these tours really, really like this um, combination of um, experiences. The bottom picture is um, the Folk Blood Festival, and it's an example of a tour being led by um, some of the Folk Blood staff to provide more access for people who are blind and have low vision. But I think what I'm going to concentrate more on today, other than exhibition design, etc., is um, some Kind of signature programs for the accessibility program. And these are all related to cognitive disabilities. The 
first one is Morning Anthony's, Morning Anthony's Hands. And Brian mentioned that because we, when we first started this program, we worked with the University of Maryland to do some a research component to this so we could understand better what the families uh, you know, coming to Morning at the Museum were looking for in the museum experience. So Morning at the Museum is for families of children on the autism spectrum. That's what we initially started with. And um, what we did is we designed the program so that we would have online uh, materials available for families to download or to um, view at home before they came to the museum. And it includes social stories, a sensory map, a picture schedule, tip sheet for the families about um, visiting the mall and visiting museums, where to park, that sort of thing. The kinds of things that they might want to bring along with them that would help the child in the museum environment, like noise canceling headphones, um, or fidget kinds of toys. And um, besides the previous materials, we had early opening hours. So we would open the museum one hour early, and we would have a small group of families that would um, make reservation for the program. So we would have, the whole purpose was to make sure that it was a small group of people so that we could kind of eliminate some of the issues that families had identified for us that um, coming to a museum was, could be very overwhelming for the child. And um, we also provided a, what we call a take a break space. Take a break space was just a, a used you know, corner of an exhibition. We had American history actually used a large closet that we kind of um, uh, made into a more um, comfortable space by having uh, mats on the floor and low lights and some movable walls. And then we have a therapist who works with us who runs the take a break space. And the take a break space has kinds of um, sensory kinds of toys um, and experiences so that if a child is feeling overwhelmed by their visit at the museum, they, they go to the room and take a break for their family. <coughs> Um, so we started this program in American History, and now we've spread it to quite a few of our museums. The zoo is now going to join on with us, so we're looking forward to adding them in. And the whole purpose of this program was to, um, to address what parents had already told us that they needed. That for a lot of them, they don't do a lot of social um, activities with their families because they're afraid of how the child is either going to be or how the child will be, um, how other people will judge them or the child. And so we wanted to offer this as an introductory way for families to come to museums. So the point is not to have them always come to something like a morning at the museum, but that they would become comfortable with coming to the museum. And then we would give them the tools for being, for being able to do that. And <coughs> the families have really enjoyed this kind of um, Now the, um, the Washington area is offering a lot of different programming for families of children on the autism spectrum, but we've also brought it to more uh, cognitive disabilities because we realize what we're doing can benefit not only um, people on the autism spectrum, but people who have other kinds of developmental disabilities. I'm not sure enough to go the lights, but this is a picture of um, our all access digital arts camp. And this is a camp that we do every summer for two weeks. And with this camp, um, we register about 20 kids with, um, who are teenagers with cognitive disabilities. And they are working in the art lab at Hershorn. They spend the two weeks going around the institution to exhibitions and developing um, projects. And for the last few years, they've been working on uh, learning how to use different media so that they could um, do films. And they would do a film about something that particularly attracted them at one of the museums. And then at the end of the program, they would present their film to, a, they'd have a film premiere at the Hirshhorn Auditorium, and all their families and friends would be able to come and see the film premiere. So it's been a very successful program. We've added on in the last year a club um, to go along with the camp so that the skills that they learn in that camp, they can continue to um, develop with the club is every every month, and they, or every other month, I'm sorry. And they come together again 
um, in the art lab and continue to do things for digital arts. This is uh, another program that we're doing through our office, and this gets more into the internship into employment side of things. This is called Access to Opportunities. These are a couple of the um, young people who have received um, the internship stipends that we provide with this particular program. So we work with the local um, foundation, and they give us money for um, a year, 18 months, to provide internships that have a stipend to kind of defray the cost of being in Washington if you're um, an intern. And for the most part, these are interns who are um, college age. And um, they could be anywhere within the institution. We tend to have a lot of people who want to come to American history but um, they can be anywhere within the institution and um, the amount of time that they're at the internship really depends on how much time they have available. The next program that we have, that is another internship program, but it's um, inter internship to employment program called Project Search. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this before, but it's a, a national model um, started about 20 years ago at the Cincinnati Children's Museum. And with Project Search, you have three partners. You have the business, which is the Smithsonian. You have the school, Ivy Mount in Rockville. And you have a um, adult services provider, which is SEEK um, in Rockville, or in Montgomery County. And the three partners work to have a nine-month program where we have a classroom on site at the Smithsonian. And Ivy Mount provides the teacher. And then we have job coaches through SEEK. And the students do three um, internship rotations. So this year, our pilot year, we had 11 students uh, that did internships around the institution, building on their skills so that at the end of the program, ideally, they are employment ready. And then to increase the diversity of the Smithsonian, we're going to hire as many as we can out of that 11. And as we continue over the years um, with these different project search um, classes, be able to, again, add to the diversity of the Smithsonian through these students. Um, so Project Search is probably my favorite program right now because I've been working so close on that and because it's a pilot year and trying to get this really off the ground. <coughs> so those are some of the programs that we're doing to, complete, to increase um, inclusion at the Smithsonian. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We can turn it over to Michael. Do we want to take questions now or hold everything until, yeah, um, let's hold everything until after Michael speaks and then we will take questions, but Beth, thank you very much. is Michael Pond. Michael Pond is the media archivist at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian, a role he has filled since 2003. In this capacity, he is responsible for acquisition, description, access, and preservation, all things we like, of historic motion picture films, something I like, video and audio recordings at the National Museum of the American Indian Archives Center. Michael has overseen preservation projects funded by the National Film Preservation Foundation, Save America's Treasures, and the Smithsonian Collections Care and Preservation Fund. Since 2012, Michael has also served as the National Museum of the American Indian's interim head archivist. His prior experiences include Save Our Sounds Project Librarian at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage and Librarian at the Nature Conservatory. Michael has a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from the University of Pittsburgh and an MLS from the University of Maryland. All right, so please welcome Michael Pond. Um, 
I, uh, I decided not to do a PowerPoint presentation because I'm going to talk about cultural sensitivities and the idea of showing a bunch of images that are sensitive seem counterintuitive. So um, the screen's going to be blank. I'm going to very quickly go over the history of the National Museum of American Indian because I think the actual institution itself provides a kind of interesting case study. And then I'd like to talk about cultural, how we deal with cultural sensitivities at our museum. And I'm going to keep this very short because I, I genuinely hope we can have a real conversation about this. I think it's a very interesting and sort of salient topic to our times. Um, so the National Museum of the American Indian actually started its life as the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation, a private institution in New York City, started by, can you all hear me? I talk pretty loud. Um, which was founded by a man named George Gustav High, who was a wealthy industrialist and um, kind of obsessive about the American material culture. He was specifically interested in things. He didn't really collect archival records or, um, or, or um, oral histories, for instance. He was interested in stuff, material culture. And over the course of his lifetime, he accumulated um, the vast majority of what is now our collection, which is about 180, I'm sorry, 825,000 objects, which are described in about 265,000 catalog records. So we have a lot of stuff that George Gustav High and his um, employees and peers accumulated. Now the interesting thing, what I, what I think is very interesting about this is when George Gustav High created the Museum of American Indian, his intended audience was white male scholars. Mm -hmm. The perception at the time, and we're talking about the turn of the 20th century, the perception among anthropologists and um, sort of scholarly researchers was that Native Americans were a dying civilization. By the end of the 20th century, they would be extinct. There would be no remnant of their civilizations left. And there was an imperative to collect as much documentation in the form of material culture as possible. And so George Gustav High, was sort of, uh, you know, people refer to him as a boxcar collector. He would literally buy train loads of, of stuff. Um, now, that's not to say he wasn't a connoisseur. He knew good things from bad things, and he focused on the good things. But his intended audience and the perception at the time was that that collection was being built for the purpose of white scholars understanding what they were looking at when they dug up an archaeological site 100 years from now. So to me, it's very interesting to think about the trajectory of this institution because now, at, so the National Museum of the American Indian was formed in 1989 when, uh, what I should say is, the Museum of the American Indian High Foundation formally incorporated in 1916 and over the course of the next 75 years had a sort of peak of its success in the 1930s and a very slow decline into the 1970s when it just fell into really dire straits, financial mismanagement. They had a huge collection um, that they were custodians of, it's public trust, and they, they simply couldn't manage it. So throughout the 1980s, there was a very complicated negotiation that led to the collection becoming part of the Smithsonian. In 1989, Congress passed the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which created our museum as part of the Smithsonian. And interestingly, this is kind of also an important detail. In 1989, uh, Congress also passed NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, which handles um, the sort of repatriation regime that almost every museum in the United States that receives federal funding has to abide by. NMAI, the National Museum of the American Indian, does not, is not a party to NAGPRA. The, our repatriation um, process is defined in our founding legislation, and it's a little bit different than NAGPRA, we can talk about that. Um, but over that 75 year period, what happened is increasingly, I mean, obviously Native Americans didn't die out. They're thriving and, and their diverse cultures are uh, represented to this day across the Americas. But the museum came to be increasingly managed by American Indians. It, it went from being a white institution to a native institution, and I think that's very interesting. Our director, Kevin Gober, is um, uh, Pawnee. Our founding director, Rick West, is Cheyenne. Our board of trustees is 
largely Native American. Uh, our staff is, it, you know, obviously it varies, but it's roughly 30% Native American. And, um, and the audience, the intended audience of, of our institution is no longer exclusively white people, right? white scholars. You know, there's, all, our constituency is, is very broad. You know, obviously, we hope to educate everyone about the lives of Native Americans, but a big part of our intended audience are Native Americans who come to our institution to learn about their heritage, to learn about their traditions, to um, learn about their family history, I mean, all sorts of things. So we have, I, I think it's very interesting, I think, I think all the time about that trajectory, that change in focus and that change in mission from being uh, kind of an ex exclusionary institution to being uh, an inclusionary institution. So I think that's a context that you know, I go to work in every day. So um, the, I work in the Archive Center, and the Archive Center has sort of two main collecting areas. We have the records of the old Museum of the American Indian, and that is a huge collection. It's like 400 linear feet of a lot of stuff. And it details, among other things, the collecting history of the museum, where all of these 825,000 things that we have in our collection came from. And sometimes that gets into some very sensitive stuff. Um, there, there's some, uh, some anthropological records, or ethnographic records, we'll, we'll say, in that, um, that, that get sensitive. And, um, but the other big part of our collecting focus is um, sort of an outgrowth of our mission as a museum. And I'd like to actually sort of tell you, um, so everybody knows the Smithsonian's uh, mission statement is the increase in diffusion of knowledge. It's like the greatest mission statement ever. Um, yeah, well, I don't mean, I, you know, it's like, I don't know. It, it, it really is, it's such a great mission. And I mean, it, it, as, as, a, as a mission statement, it really does, it motivates me every day I go to work and I think about what a fantastic purpose that is for us to aspire to. Um, and the National Museum of the American Indian has a mission statement that supports that, but it's a little bit uh, its own thing. And I'll, I'd like to tell you, it's the National Museum of the American Indian is committed to advancing knowledge and understanding of the native cultures of the Western Hemisphere, past, present, and future, through partnership with native people and others. The museum works to support the continuance of culture, traditional values, and traditions in contemporary Native life. And that word contemporary is really important to what we're doing in the Archive Center. We are focused on collecting the archival records of artists, activists, writers, thought leaders, and organizations that um, of, in, in contemporary Native American life. And there are a few reasons for this. I mean, one is that we don't have a lot of historical records. George Gustav High wasn't interested in collecting that, and um, those records, in a, a lot of cases, are in state and local historical societies. They're at um, the National Anthropological Archive at the Museum of Natural History. So we feel like we have an opportunity to create something new by focusing on contemporary records. But, um, but it also helps support the mission of our museum by creating a, a place for materials that I, I think a lot of people aren't focused on. I think a lot of people fail to recognize the value of, of these contemporary records and contextualizing um, Native American life today. Um, so NMAI has in our archive, in addition to hundreds of linear feet of records, we have tens of thousands of historical photographs. And the photographs represent, I mean, they're incredible. They're, they're, they're beautiful and they um, demonstrate. They're, they're an interesting opportunity because they show a lot of things about our material culture, the objects in our collection in context, but they also, just as historical photographs, they're, they're amazing. But a lot of those photographs contain highly sensitive content. And we, we have, like I mentioned, we have uh, ethnographic records that contain sensitive content. We have motion picture films that are highly sensitive ceremonies. But the vast majority of the material in our archive that is sensitive are photographs. And one of the things that 
is a challenge for us at NMAI is the recognition that there is no singular Native America when you talk about cultural sensitivity in the Native American context. It isn't like, there, there is no one set of sensitivities that you can need to be sort of attuned to. It's the concept of sensitivities that you have to be attuned to and you have to recognize the diversity of them across the Western Hemisphere. There are as many, I have something written here. It is important to recognize that there is no singular belief system for all Native Americans. The spiritual beliefs and practices of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere are as diverse as the rest of their tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So NMAI must be prepared to respect the diversity of knowledge and belief systems and the cultural sensitivities that come with them. And what that means for us, in addition to simply trying to keep track of this information, is, um, is putting in place some policies for managing this stuff. And one of the things, that is, so photos are a good example. When people come to do photo research at NMAI, we present them often with a binder of photographs from a specific tribe. And that binder has a manila folder in the back that has sensitive photographs in it. Now this is, I mean, this is kind of the 20th century model for how we've done things. We're, now that most of these photographs have been digitized, we're able to run database reports that filter out sensitive photographs. But what I was surprised to learn uh, when I started working at NMAI, I assumed that a lot of these sensitivities had to do with, for instance, uh, Navajo people not wanting non-Navajo people to see a ceremony. That is absolutely true. That is often the case. But one of the things that I was surprised and kind of had to prepare myself for was how often those sensitivities are in, within communities. There are Navajo people who don't, who know that, for instance, a ceremony is not for them. They haven't been inducted into a society that it may be a ceremony that's for men and not for women, or for women and not for men. They don't want to see that stuff. And so by putting it you know, behind a little bit of a wall in the middle envelope or whatever, they we kind of empower people to make a decision for themselves. Do I want to see this? You know, I can give you a database report with a description of what the photograph is, and then it's up to you if you want to look at it or not. Um, in terms of providing access to sensitive materials to people who are outside of communities, the way that we handle that is through um, requiring that people researchers inform tribes that they're interested in census materials that we are stewards of. So that may be, uh, they may need to contact a cultural heritage office and send and have that office send us a letter, on tribal letterhead, saying, we are familiar with this researcher, we know what they are um, <coughs> studying, and they have our permission to see our sensitive materials. And I, I should say, I'm focused, you know, I'm, I'm really, focusing on archival materials. That same policy holds for um, uh, material culture, sacred objects, sensitive objects in our, uh, in our collection. So all of this, what all of this kind of gets at is this idea of multiple, of, of knowledge systems. You know, what, what we are responsible for as stewards of these collections is managing other people's knowledge systems. And that is very challenging when you come from a Western perspective in the idea that all information is for everyone and it should all last forever and be available everywhere. Um, not everybody believes that. And it's been very, it's, it's, that's a hard thing as an archivist, as somebody who tries to uphold the core values and ethics of the site and um, There, is a document that was written to try and codify some of these practices. It's called the Protocols for Archival, Native American Archival Materials. And I will simply say, it, it's referred to in our sort of little archival community as the protocols. And as a Jewish person, it has taken me years to get over the protocols, not meaning the protocols of the elders of Zion and, and running the other direction. Um, so the protocols of for Native American okay. archival materials, and I, I strongly encourage all of you to, to just take a look at this. It, they were kind of heavily informed by some uh, some ethics guidelines that were written um, in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Island Strait um, archival materials. 
And they outlined some of the, these ideas of limiting access to sensitive materials. And I, uh, the, his, the sort of history of this document has been very interesting because it was submitted to SAA, to the, the um, Executive Council, I think that's what it is, of SAA, for endorsement, and they declined to endorse it, which led to all kind of rancorous time at SAA. Where it, for several years, there were um, roundtable meetings at the annual meeting to discuss this. Um, but what it boils down to is that within SAA, there is um, a sort of old guard that really holds very tightly to the idea that all information belongs to everyone and it should be accessible to everyone with a minimum of restrictions. And the idea that that, and I, I, I disagree with that. I, I think that, um, that that attitude is the embodiment of our knowledge system and the, that those are our values. But I am a steward of other people's material, other people's cultural heritage, and that is an embodiment of their values and their knowledge system. And as a respectful steward, I have to abide by that. So it's complicated, and it is particularly, I, I, one of the things I think about is, so I, I require, if you want to see a sensitive photograph of, for instance, a burial, I'm going to tell you that you have to go to the Tribal Heritage Office, you have to get a letter, and you can come back to me. However, Smithsonian is a quasi-federal institution. That kind of restriction, there is, no, there is no basis in the law for me requiring that action. And I've, there, there's, if, if somebody really wanted to put it to a challenge, I, I'd be interested in knowing how that would play out, for instance, in court. I, I don't know how it would play out. And um, in the United States, we have copyright. Copyright is very imperfect. Uh, it doesn't really, it's just, it doesn't apply to this. When you think about what copyright really is about, copyright is about, um, is about privileging somebody's uh, sort of, here's the word I'm looking for, privileging somebody's investment in the fixed expression of an idea for monetary gain. But when you're talking about cultural heritage, especially for people who've had oral traditions for thousands of years, there is no authoritative fixed expression of a creation myth. And if there is, who, who gets to claim the specific ownership of that? So the idea, there are all sorts of ideas that copyright really doesn't address. Group ownership, moral rights, um, it kind of goes on and on. So we kind of try to navigate this. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a difficult, um, it's, it's a narrow path, but we try at NMAI to be respectful stewards while simultaneously providing the broadest reasonable access to um, the most people. And I think that that kind of understanding of knowledge, of, of diverse knowledge systems, I think that that is an emerging um, an emerging part of our field, it's an emerging, uh, the understanding of it within library and archival sciences is, is growing right now. And I, I think it'll be interesting to see in 10 or 15 years how people's attitudes about it. For instance, if, the, if, if whatever the next version of this document that the protocols for Native American archival materials, you know, that's gonna be revised and it's gonna be revisited and somebody's gonna take it back to SAA or endorsement in a few years. And it will be interesting to see if a, there has been a generational change in attitude at, um, within our profession. So I really look forward to hearing what you all think about um, these sort of complicated ideas. And, uh, and, and I'm really pleased that I got to come talk to you today. We're going to take a few minutes for questions. Um, Beth, if you'd like to come back up. Erin um, is going to walk around the audience with a microphone. I see 
Um, Doug has one, maybe up to three questions in the back. <laughs> so we'll start with So uh, on the last talk, I really love this sort of image, even without the image, of the uh, manila envelope, right? And, and I'm trying to imagine now what that will look like 30 years from now when we, when we somehow embed into our information systems the values that we hold, right? So, so I have two questions. One, one is what... <laughs> I have two questions. <laughs> One of them is, am I even allowed to know the manila envelope exists? Is it always the case that you can at least tell me that there's a decision to be made? The second question is, it, who is the person who controls it? In the first case, it was the person who encountered the manila envelope, but later in your story, it was someone down the hall who was the keeper <coughs> of the values. And so I'm, I'm wondering, are there, are there cases in which one person has the right to deny access to another? Hmm. Oh, hey. Um, I, we're having fun with it, Well, um, yeah. I, um, in terms of the, the digital version of the Manila envelope, um, that's an interesting. That's an interesting case because pe that's an area of a lot of thought right now. There's a really awesome project out of Washington State University. There's a, um, a professor there, uh, Kim Christian, who has put together. She did research in New Zealand and working with the traditional community <coughs> in New Zealand. She uh, um, she developed essentially a um, a database, a, a sort of uh, digital cataloging system, and it, it was interesting because it, in its original incarnation, it was a standalone machine. It wasn't networked to anything. If you wanted to access it, you went to the tribal heritage office, and you logged in. And where it gets interesting is that there are different roles assigned to people, and you can have a role where you are assigned elder, and you have access to all sorts of information, and you can have another role that's assigned you as outside researcher, and you see it much we more representative today. <laughs> <laughs> you put it on mute, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that system has been uh, put online, this sort of infrastructure behind it has been put online, and there's an instance of it called the Plateau People's Web Portal, which is um, run out of the University of Washington State University, and they have a memorandum of understanding with the <coughs> Plateau area tribes and some cultural heritage institutions like the National Museum of American Indian. And we're providing content based on our collections for that system, and then tribal elders can log in, and they can embed tribal knowledge into these catalog records, and based on their level of access, they can see or add sensitive information. So that's a kind of, that's, an emerging thing right now, but that's an example of the kind of the kind of level of control that people are trying to put on sensitive cultural knowledge. So I, I, now, as far as uh, what I, I love this, that we're using the sort of Western concept now of a database. Oh yeah, no, I mean it's it's it, it's a weird it's it's a weird amalgam, and and I I don't think it's perfect. I don't think anybody does, but it is there is an interesting way to try and address. Well, and, and, and okay, so the other part of it that I think is really interesting is as a cultural institution, one of the things we are always striving for is to get tribal knowledge back into our description. Like, you know, NMA and I has these, you know, we have 265,000 catalog records that were all written by anthropologists in the earliest part of the 20th century, and they were wrong so often. <laughs> uh, well, and part of it, you know, to be fair, part of the reason why they're wrong is just that the perception of what they were doing was so fundamentally different. There was this idea that essentially everything was a text, and if you just look at this pot, you would automatically know, oh, that's a Hopi pot versus the Suzuni pot. And it's like, you know, now we're 100 years removed from this, and we can't just tell them apart. So the, the attitude was so fundamentally different then that we really need tribal information, we need culture bearers to tell us what we are the stewards of, in a sense. 
And so the Applied Tool People's Web Portal in its most ideal manifestation will be this opportunity for elders and tradition bearers and um, cultural practitioners of all kinds to feed us their knowledge and enhance our description. Now some of that's gonna be sensitive and it's gonna have to be kind of walled off in various ways, but some of it's not. It's gonna literally be, that's not a threshing basket, that's a fish net or something like that. Um, and, and these sorts of things happen all the time. To get to your second question, it, it is very, very complicated and, and, and again, imperfect, sort of limiting access and providing access. Um, we rely on people to, to be honest with us, for one thing. So when, when tribe member, tribal members come, if they want to see something in an envelope, you know, that's, that's sort of up to them. When a researcher, an outside researcher, contacts us, um, we, we rely on them to be honest, too. And for the most part, people are. I, you know, one of the things I really want to emphasize is people really want to be respectful. I mean, it's not, that's not universally the case. We've had some weird instances. We, one of the things that's always a little bit strange, we loan out objects for exhibition all the time. And one of, the, of our requirements, generally speaking, for loaning out objects uh, for exhibition is that there be tribal involvement in the curation of the exhibition. Um, that's very difficult to do in Europe. Um, there's often not tribal participation in European exhibitions. And they really, those exhibitions often really sort of traffic in this sense of otherness and exotic, uh, the idea of it, something being exotic or magical. And, um, and those, I mean, I, I feel like, I don't even know why we loan them objects, because they're, they're, they're I'm serious, like, it's just like, it's so in conflict with our values as a museum, and, you know, I, I, if it was entirely, it was up to me, we wouldn't even loan them objects. But, so, I hope that I've answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, we only have time for about two more questions, so Aaron will be going around with the microphone on this. This is an easy question. <coughs> Could you talk a little bit more about why the material is sensitive or what type sure. of material? Sure. Oh, is? yeah. Well, um, so it may be ceremonial. It may be of burials. Uh, photographs of burials are highly, highly sensitive. And some tribes' photographs of deceased people are highly sensitive. Um, and what I mean when I say highly sensitive, I mean, they should have never been taken in the first place. Um, uh, there's a great, there's a really interesting example, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this very fast. Um, in 1923, the Museum of the American Indian was participating in a major excavation in uh, Galp, New Mexico, of a Zuni settlement called Hawaku. And during that excavation, they shot some really interesting motion picture film. Um, uh, a lot of just sort of traditional practices like uh, baking bread, grinding corn, um, making an oven, building, uh, making adobe bricks and building a house. And at the same time, they filmed some ceremonies. And some of these, cere these ceremonies are kind of on a gradient of sensitivity. There was some that were, you know, they probably shouldn't have filmed them, but they weren't that sensitive. And then there is one that actually, my museum, the Museum of American Indian, declined to even fund the filming of it. It was so sensitive. And the filmmaker, the photographer, got somebody else to pay for them to stay and pay for the film. And this ceremony is, I mean, it's explosive how sensitive it was. In fact, what was filmed isn't even really the ceremony because the ceremony requires a certain number of participants and some people wouldn't participate. So there's an argument that's made that, that they didn't actually film the ceremony at all. There's a really interesting project that happened where they restored this film and, and embedded some tribal knowledge. And, uh, there's an interesting moment, so I've now seen this film, which will only ever screen with a Zuni person there to interpret it. That's sort of the agreement now. And it's really interesting. In 1923, which is, you know, just to kind of think about our sense of sort of protest and cultural ownership, one of the ceremony participants just stopped in front of the camera and blocked filming for several minutes. And I just thought that was really powerful. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why things are sensitive. Hi, uh, this is a question for both of you, but I was thinking of it particularly during Beth's presentation. Um, how I work in a public library, and I'm thinking of starting a book group for people with uh, developmental disabilities. Um, now I'm thinking of connecting that with a visit to a museum. 
how would you expect perhaps uh, an, I, an I school or a public library to partner with you? What are your expectations? What are your needs? I think that's great. That, uh, that would be a very um, powerful collaborative to um, work with the library and you know, bring students to the museum. Um, I think that it's going to depend on which museum you want to go to and what kind of materials we have about that museum. So American history, national history, a number of other museums, we have um, a variety of social stories, a variety of previous materials that you could use with the group um, to prepare them for their visit. And um, you could either do something like participate in a morning at the museum with the group, or you could um, use the materials and just visit during regular visiting hours but potentially um, have a staff member who would work with you. Um, we get a lot of families calling um, in advance of a visit, saying that they have a child who's on the autism spectrum, and they're kind of afraid of what they, you know, just to come to the museum during regular hours. So oftentimes, we're trying to work out something with the staff to uh, provide a tour so we can um, control the situation a little bit better for the family. Um, so we could work with you in a variety of ways, I think either through morning at the museum or working with staff um, to provide tours. Yeah, it'd be great. The only other thing I'd add, depending on the age group of the group you're talking about, um, National Museum of American Indian and now Natural History, uh, both have um, uh, uh, um, uh, resource centers for, um, for, for children and that um, they can do some specific programming. What, the Discovery Center? Yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause. <laughs> we are going to need just a couple of minutes to set up, and then we're going to get right into it because we want to try to stay as close to schedule as possible today. So you have about two minutes for more coffee, juice, bagels, etc., and then we will.